Well, now I would like to do a physics problem that will illustrate um, how we can use the trigonometry skills that we've been learning to help us solve a problem in physics. So I'll tell you up front, uh, trigonometry is just a small part of this problem, but that's pretty typical of using trig in physics. Usually um, the trigonometry will be a small part of the problem, a small but important part. So this will just illustrate uh, a typical way that trigonometry can come up in your physics problems. Um, well, why don't you pause the video and try this problem on your own? Okay, I hope you actually tried uh, the problem. Well, um, now we can go through this together. It's good to begin by choosing a problem-solving framework. The first framework that you learn about in your phys physics class is kinematics. And we can apply kinematics here. And the clue is that the information that we're given um, all fits into kinematics. Here's a distance, which you can plug into kinematics. And here's a time, which you can plug into kinematics. And also the question that they're asking us for, the acceleration, that's also a kinematics variable. So since every single variable that's mentioned here um, is relevant to kinematics, um, we'll uh, guess that kinematics would be a good framework for attacking this problem. So in fact, what we'll be using here is um, one-dimensional kinematics. So I'm kind of assuming that you've already covered the one-dimensional kinematics chapter of, um, of, your, of your class so that you're familiar with the basic ideas behind this type of problem. Here's a general method for solving one-dimensional kinematics problems. You should print this handout out. Um, you can find a link to this in the uh, video description box. So when you're doing um, kinematics problems, there's kind of two types of kinematics, constant velocity or constant non-zero acceleration. So we have to decide which of those applies in this case. Well, the problem told us that we have constant acceleration. And I think it's implying that that's a constant non-zero acceleration. That would also uh, make sense based on the situation in the problem. So we'll say that uh, this is a problem where we have constant non-zero acceleration. That's a case where we can use um, kinematics. So the object that is experiencing um, that constant non-zero acceleration is the package. And the interval of time during which it's experiencing that constant non-zero acceleration is while it is sliding down the ramp. Next, we should check that our given units are consistent. Well, we're given units basically of meters and seconds, and yep, there's no contradiction between those units. So those units are okay. Uh, this step is not relevant because this is for symbolic problems and we're working on a numeric problem. Um, we should draw the object's path in our sketch. Um, and basically, I guess we can just already use the sketch that we were given and say that the object will be moving along this line. This line here that represents the surface of the ramp, we can also think of that as representing the path of the package as it goes from the top to the bottom of the ramp. We should build any given distance information into our sketch. The only information we were given was this 0.9 meters, and that's already been built into the sketch for us. We were also given the information of 30 degrees, and that's also been built into the sketch for us. We should write down the key points in time in our sketch. Um, well, we have to choose what will be the key points in time. Um, usually the beginning of the path is a key point in time, so I'll call this point in time, time zero, and we can set that equal to zero. And the only other point in time we really care about here is at the end of the path, at the bottom of the ramp. So I'll call that T1. And we know that it took three seconds for the package to go from the top to the bottom of the ramp. Um, well, we want to keep building all available information into the sketch. So from the top to the bottom of the ramp is three seconds. And since we assumed that we're starting at a time equal to zero, if three seconds passes, then at the bottom of the ramp, we can say that the time is equal to three seconds. This is the uh, point in time, and this is a point in time. 
and this is the interval of time that elapses between those two points in time. So this was a key point in time because we know something about it. We know how much time passes from here to here. Okay, so we wrote down the key points of time in our sketch, and we also built the information about time that we were given into our sketch. We should write down our axes. Usually for general one-dimensional kinematics, you want your axes to point in the object's direction of motion. Well, the problem told us that the package was sliding down the ramp. So our direction of motion would be parallel to and down the ramp. So I chose the positive x-axis to be um, pointing in our direction of motion down the ramp, and here's the y-axis. Those were our axes. Now we should identify the question with a question mark and a symbol. Well, the question is asking for the magnitude and direction of the package's acceleration. What's a good symbol for the magnitude of the acceleration? That's A. And how can we symbolize the direction of the acceleration? Well, there's no one uh, simple standard uh, symbol for that, so we can symbolize that with a combination of a symbol and a word. I'm not going to say the direction of A here, because remember that A stands for a magnitude, and magnitudes don't have a direction. But you should know that with the arrow, this stands for the complete acceleration vector, and vectors do have a direction. So we wrote down um, a question mark uh, that indicated the question, uh, and we wrote down a symbol uh, for the question, or a combination of words and um, a symbol. In this case, I don't think it's particularly convenient to build the question into the sketch. Um, and also, we can do a little bit more work here. What's our plan for figuring out this acceleration? Well, notice that basically the problem is asking about the overall acceleration vector, the magnitude and direction of the overall acceleration vector. They didn't use the word overall, but that's implied by this wording. Um, but a good way to figure out overall vectors is to find the components. So what the question is asking us for is the overall vector. But in order to figure that out, we need the components. If we know the x and y components for the acceleration, then we can find the overall acceleration. Well, actually, we can already figure out um, a sub y, because this object is motionless in the y component. The object is moving parallel to the x-axis, so the object is motionless in its y component. And if the object is motionless in the y component, That means the y acceleration is zero. Well, that's a simple number that will simplify our work. Since the object is motionless in the y component, its y acceleration is zero. Let's explain that a little bit more carefully. The object is motionless in the y component. That means the object has a constant v sub y of zero. If we're motionless in the y component, then the object has a constant v sub y of zero. And when v sub y is constant, that's when a sub y is zero. So that's the technical reason why being motionless in the y component gives us a zero um, y acceleration. By the way, notice that um, the uh, x and y axes here are not vertical and horizontal. In many problems, x is horizontal and y is vertical, but that's not the case in this problem. In this problem, it was convenient to use a um, slanted x-axis and therefore a slanted y-axis. So we wouldn't say here that the vertical acceleration is zero. We would just say that the y component of the acceleration is zero, or a sub y is zero. Okay, well, remember we needed the two components to figure out the overall acceleration. So in a sense, we're 50% we're done. We already know the y component. So really all we need to do is figure out a sub x. When we can figure out a sub x, that will tell us the overall acceleration because there's no contribution from the y component.
So oftentimes when you identify a question, it's also good to make a plan as to what you need to answer the question. You know, we made a plan as to what we needed to answer that question. Now we should identify our initial and final positions on the path. Well, we said there was only really two key points in time in this problem, so it shouldn't surprise you that we'll choose the first key point in time, time zero, as the initial point, and the second key point in time, t1, as the final point. Those are good points in time because we know information about them. We know the amount of time that passes between time zero and time one. Okay, and now next um, we're either going to use the left-hand column or the right-hand column. Um, if we were doing a constant velocity problem, we'd use the left-hand column, but instead we decided we were doing constant non-zero acceleration. So we're using this right-hand column. Um, and are we using an X component or a Y component? Um, well, again, you can see this is one-dimensional kinematics. This is one-dimensional kinematics because the object is moving in a straight line, just parallel to the X axis. We used that when we said A sub Y is zero. So we really only need X variables. We have, um, this is one-dimensional kinematics along the X axis. We already finished thinking about the y component when we said a sub y is zero. So now we have to focus on the x component. And the setup for kinematics is to write down these five kinematics variables. Just write down the variables. So let's do that setup. As I said, I hope you've already covered the one-dimensional uh, kinematics chapter of your, your textbook in your class, and hopefully what we're going through now is a review of that material. Uh, if you've never seen this material before, it might be a little hard uh, to follow. So uh, we have delta t, delta x, v initial x, v final x, and a sub x. Those are our five kinematics variables. By the way, there's really two different ways to attack kinematics. Um, you can use, so do you know what this stands for? This is um, the x component of the displacement. Well, sometimes when we do kinematics, we focus on displacement. Other times when we do kinematics or projectile motion, we focus on position. When you're doing kinematics and projectile motion, you can focus either on displacement or on position. And which one is more convenient kind of depends on the specific type of problem or the specifics of the problem that you're looking at. Um, when you're doing two-dimensional projectile motion, it's usually best to focus on position. But when you're doing um, general one-dimensional kinematics, for general one-dimensional kinematics, it's usually best to focus on displacement. And that's why I've built that into the handout here. So we'll focus on displacement here, although you could solve the problem using position. So that was our setup. Remember again, this column isn't relevant for this problem, and this component isn't relevant. This is the only part that's relevant. Now we want to build the question or what is needed into our setup. Well, none of these is precisely what the question is asking us for. But we know we need a sub x in order to figure out what we need here. So I'm not going to label any of these with a question mark because none of these is exactly what the question is asking us for. But I will label that a sub x is the variable that we need. All right, so either um, put a question mark into your setup or as what we did here, just label what's needed. Now we need to um, fill in the rest of our setup. Delta T, we determined, was 3 seconds. When you write a number by itself, remember to always include units. And then how about delta X, the object's to displacement? Well, the object is going from here to here, so this distance is going to be the displacement. So should I write down Zero point nine meters for that. They gave us a distance, zero point nine meters. So is that the displacement? Well, I hope you didn't think that was the displacement. In a way, that was the trap or the trick in this problem. This is a distance, but it's not the distance that we need. The distance that we need 
to find the delta x is this distance. When we know this distance, we'll know the delta x. And that's not what we were given. Um, so um, are we out of luck? Do we, have to, do we have to give up? Is there no way to solve the problem? Well, now finally we get to use um, all that trigonometry that we've been learning. Because notice, this is a right triangle where we know one side and one angle. And we've learned that if you have a right triangle where you know a side and an angle, you can figure out all the other sides using SOHCAHTOA. So here's our chance to practice that trigonometry. Um, if you haven't done so already, now would be a good time to, to, to try to work that out. So if you haven't already figured this out, maybe you should pause the video now and see if you can use trigonometry. And remember what we need is the length of this side of the triangle. Okay, um, so now let's work on that uh, together. So we want to use... First of all, I'm actually going to label this as the magnitude of the displacement because what we want here is a length. We're trying to figure out the length of this side, um, and a length can only be uh, positive, never negative. Um, so I'll put in absolute value signs to say that uh, technically we're figuring out here the magnitude of the displacement. That doesn't really make any difference on this particular problem because the displacement will come out to be positive anyway. So the absolute value signs don't make any difference, but it's a little bit better symbology here to say that um, the trigonometry is gonna give us the magnitude of the displacement. Now we know that in order to use SOHCAHTOA, we need to label the sides. This side is the hypotenuse because it's across from the 90 degree angle. Now which of these two angles are we focusing on? Remember that who is opposite and who's adjacent depends on which angle you're focusing on. Well, you can focus on whichever angle you please, but it seems much more natural to focus on the angle that we were given, the 30 degrees. So let's focus on this angle, and we can say that this side is adjacent to the 30 degrees, and we can say that this side is opposite to the angle that we're focusing on, the 30 degrees. Um, so now should we use sine, cosine, or tangent? Well, um, let's see. We want to use the information we were given, the 0.9 meters, and the 0.9 meters deals with the opposite side. So we're not going to use cosine. We're not going to use cosine because the cosine doesn't deal with the opposite side, so it won't give us an opportunity to use the number that we were given. And we're trying to figure out the hypotenuse. We want to know the hypotenuse, so I'm also not going to use tangent. I'm not going to use tangent because the tangent doesn't deal with the hypotenuse, so it won't give us a chance to directly figure out what we need. So it looks like we're going to use sine. The sine of the angle equals the length of the opposite side over the length of the hypotenuse. While the opposite side is our number of 0.9 meters, and the hypotenuse represents, remember this is the length of the hypotenuse. Trigonometry is about lengths. That's why I put in these absolute value signs here. We want the magnitude of the displacement because magnitudes can never be negative and lengths can never be negative. Um, okay, um, so you can see that sine was the correct trig function to use because it allows us to use the number we were given and it also allows us to figure out the variable that we're trying to figure out. Um, if it wasn't obvious to you, if it wasn't obvious to you which of these three functions to use, I guess you could just use um, trial and error. You could try one, and if it doesn't work, try a different one until you get one that works. Okay, now um, we're trying to solve here for the magnitude of delta x. So we need to get this variable out of the bottom of the fraction. I'll multiply both sides by the magnitude of the displacement. Because I want to get that variable out of the denominator. 
we could just use our calculator now to calculate sine 30. It would be a good idea if you wanted to just use your calculator to um, calculate sine 30. Or we can carry it around as a sine 30 and divide both sines by the sine of 30 because we're still trying to get the variable by itself. Now we can use our calculator to do this calculation. Point 0.9 divided by sine 30. Make sure that you're in degrees mode. When you get down to a final number, you should put the units back in. Well, this is a displacement, so it's in meters. This number that we put in was in meters. We put in a number in meters, so to be consistent, the number should come out in meters. And when you figure something out, you should always go back and build it into your sketch. So we can build that 1.8 meters into the sketch. That's this distance. Now, this is an intermediate result, but this is a good time to stop and ask whether this intermediate result makes sense. Does this make sense? Um, well, let's see. What uh, should we check here? I guess the big thing to do is to compare this number and this number. Notice this number came out bigger than this. Does that make sense? Well, yes, because this is the hypotenuse, and the hypotenuse should be the longest side of the triangle. Suppose this number had come out to be, um, say, 0 0.75 meters. If this had come out to be 0 0.75 meters, we would know that was wrong, because there's no way this length could be less than this length. So this, um, the fact that this is bigger than 0.9 does give us a way to check um, that we're on the right track that when you use SOHCAHTOA, there's almost always a way to check whether the, your answer makes sense. Try to get into the habit of checking whether your answers make sense, including when you're, you're using um, SOHCAHTOA. That will help you to catch your mistakes and also give you a better intuition for what you're doing. Okay, so now we can build what we figured out into our setup. So remember, um, I shouldn't have left this. This was, our, this was an incorrect thing to write down. Some students might mistakenly try to plug in the 0.9 meters in this position, but that's wrong because this is not the distance that we need. The box is not actually being displaced along this distance. The displacement we need is this, the 1.8 meters. By the way, notice here we're finally going to transition from the magnitude of the displacement to the full displacement, and the only difference is that this should have a plus or a minus sign. So should this be plus or minus? Well, the object is starting here and being displaced in this direction, which we've chosen as our positive direction. So it's best here to say that this displacement is positive 1.8 meters. Um, because this is positive, it didn't really make much difference whether we used an absolute value sign here or not, because uh, this, this number is the uh, delta x is the same as its absolute value. Um, the point of the absolute values was just to remind you that SOHCAHTOA is about lengths, and lengths can never be negative. But this symbol could theoretically, this symbol could theoretically be negative, although it isn't on this problem. So I used a symbol that could be never, that could never be negative when I was uh, focusing on the lengths in SOHCAHTOA. It's good to always try to use the exact right symbol. Okay, um, so the SOHCAHTOA didn't tell us that the displacement was positive. That was something that we added after the SOHCAHTOA um, when we uh, saw that the object was being displaced in our positive direction. All right, well, now we're actually done with the trigonometry part of the problem. Um, that was the trigonometry part of the problem, just uh, finding um, this distance. Uh, but now we need to go ahead and uh, complete our solution to the question. Do we know what um, V initial X is? Well, remember we were told the package started from rest, started from rest. 
which tells us that the initial velocity at time zero is zero. The final x we don't know at this point, so I can write a symbol for that. I can say a more specific symbol would be v sub 1x, because the final point is time 1. So we don't know what this number is, but we could say it's the x component of the velocity at time 1. And a sub x, obviously we don't know. That's what we're trying to figure out. So I'll just keep writing that as a sub x. I hope that um, nobody has the idea of trying to plug in 9.8 meters per second squared here. That would be wrong. This is not, uh, we would never plug in 9.8 meters per second squared for an a sub x anyway. Uh, but also, this is not a projectile motion problem. This is not projectile motion um, because there's something touching the package. The, um, the ramp is touching the package, and therefore the package is feeling a force from the ramp. Remember, projectile motion is when the only force on an object is the force of the Earth's gravity. But gravity is not the only force on the package. There's also the force from the ramp. Therefore, this is not a projectile motion problem. And therefore, we're not going to use 9.8 meters per second squared as an acceleration. 9.8 meters per second squared is used pretty much only for projectile motion problems. So it would be wrong to try to plug that in here. We just don't know what this acceleration is yet. Okay, so um, that we completed this step. We wrote down a number or symbol for the remaining variables. Since the object started at rest, its initial velocity was zero. Okay, and now again, we have to decide whether we're in the left column or the right column. Well, we're in the right column because we're doing a constant non-zero acceleration problem. So we'll disregard the left column. We'll use the, the right column. So for constant non-zero acceleration, you need to know three variables from your setup, and then you can choose an equation three variables. And we know these three variables. Um, we know uh, three variables. By the way, that's the rule when you're working with displacement rather than position. So this is the rule, um, this is the rule that works when you're working, when you're solving the problem using displacement as we are here rather than position. All right, so since we do know these three variables, we can choose an equation. The fastest way to do that is to figure out the variable we don't care about. Which variable do we not care about? Well, we obviously care about these three variables because we want to plug in numbers for those. And we clearly care about this variable because this is what we're trying to figure out. So the variable we don't care about, we don't care about v final x. So we can pick an equation that's missing v final x. That's already labeled here in the handout. Here's the equation that's missing v final x. So this is the equation we're going to use because it's missing the variable we don't care about. So we'll write down the equation delta x equals v initial x delta t plus one half a sub x delta t squared. This is the version of the kinematics equation that uses displacement rather than position. Um, now we can plug in our delta x is 1.8. Here's that number we figured out from Sokotoa. We needed to do the Sokotoa so we could figure out that number. The initial x is zero. So that whole term will become zero. A sub x, we don't know. Delta t is three. To keep the math simpler, it's usually best, uh, if your math skills are weak, not to try to plug the units into the equation. Um, when you write the number by itself, you can write down the units, but in the equation, we won't, we won't write down the units. Okay, so here is our equation, again, um, the only reason that this, um, now there's only one unknown in this equation, and that's because we used Sokotoa to figure out this number. Remember, the trap on this problem is that a lot of people would try to plug 0.9 in here. If you try to plug, if you try to plug 0.9 in here, in this position, you'll clearly get the wrong answer. That's the main trap or difficulty on this problem. Well, now we should be able to solve. 
1 half of 9 is 4.5. We'll divide by 4.5 to get the a sub x by itself. That comes out to be 0.4. Now when you get down to a single number, you should always put the units back in. And the units here should be consistent with the units that we put in. So the units we put in were in terms of meters and seconds. So what are the units for acceleration that are consistent with meters and seconds? Well, those are the SI units meters per second squared, so be sure you put in those units. We should check if this um, result makes sense. Well, notice that this came out positive. In fact, I'll put a plus sign in front to emphasize that it came out positive. Does that make sense? Well, yes, I think we were expecting that the object um, was going to be accelerating down um, the ramp. Notice they said it started from rest and then moved with constant acceleration down the ramp. If it started from rest at the top, the only way it could move down the ramp is if it was accelerating down the ramp. So we should have, been, should have been expecting all along that the acceleration would be down the ramp, which is our positive direction. So if this answer had come out to be negative, if we had gotten a negative answer, that really wouldn't make sense, and that would be a clue that we'd made a mistake. So you can check whether your answer is positive or negative, and that gives you a clue as to whether the answer makes sense. All right, so we completed this step. We knew three variables, so we chose an equation, and um, we solved for that. We can continue to make a few uh, more checks here. I guess I'll finish writing the answer, and then we can do some more checks. So here we used the idea that when a vector has a zero component, the overall vector simply reflects the non-zero component. The magnitude of the overall vector is the same as the magnitude of the non-zero component. That was 0.4 meters per second squared here. And the direction of the overall vector is the same as the direction of the non-zero component. This component was pointing down the ramp, so the direction of the overall vector was also down the ramp. I think this is a pretty intuitive rule. Um, so now we're ready to write down our answer to the question. In fact, this is the answer right here. We should do some checks. Make sure you've answered the right question and that you've answered all parts of the question. Well, um, the question was asking about the magnitude and direction of the package's acceleration. So yes, we've answered the exact right question. Do you see what I mean by saying that make sure you've answered all parts of the question? A lot of students would just say that the answer is 0.4 meters per second squared. Many students would just say the answer is 0.4 meters per second squared because they would forget that the problem was also asking for the direction. So make sure that you've answered all parts of the question. Um, we should check that we included um, units, and we did. Without units, this answer would be wrong. Physics answers require units. This is not relevant because this is for symbolic answers, and our answer is numeric. We should also check that our answer makes sense. Well, we've already confirmed that the direction of this acceleration makes sense. Um, we would expect the object to be accelerating down the ramp um, if it... Uh, that's the only way it could start from rest at the top and then slide down with constant acceleration. Um, does this number make sense? Well, is there anything you could compare this number to to see if the size makes sense? Most people don't have too much intuition for acceleration numbers, but there's one number we could compare this to. We could compare it to 9.8 meters per second squared, the free fall acceleration due to gravity. Uh, you can see this number is less than 9.8, and that makes sense. Um, since the object is not in free fall, since it's sliding down the ramp, since this object is not in free fall, but is instead sliding down the ramp, 
we would expect that um, it would be accelerating at less than free fall acceleration. So if we had gotten an answer of say 12 meters per second squared, if this had been your answer, I hope it would have been apparent that that was wrong. It doesn't make any sense that the object um, could um, accelerate down the ramp at greater than free fall acceleration. Your acceleration down a slanted ramp should be less um, than free fall um, acceleration, not more. So if we'd gotten a number that was bigger than 9.8, that would be a strong clue that we made a mistake. And the fact that our answer is less than 9.8 is a sign that we got this correct. You might be a little worried that it's so much less than 9.8. This is accelerating way slower than um, free fall. That's not too surprising. Um, this is a fairly shallow ramp, and that would tend to decrease the um, acceleration. And um, also, it could have a lot of friction. If there's a lot of friction on the ramp, then that could slow down um, the uh, rate of acceleration to be much less than free fall. In fact, maybe that's the whole purpose of this ramp. Remember, what we have here is a package, maybe a valuable package. If you just dropped the package straight down 0.9 meters, if you just dropped it straight down 0.9 meters, it would fall with free fall acceleration, and um, it would be moving so quickly at the bottom that um, it might damage itself uh, when it hits the ground. So it might be better to let it slide down a gradual, um, friction, uh, uh, gradual ramp with some friction. That way, if it, uh, it uh, accelerates at a slow rate, it'll be moving pretty slowly, and it's not going to damage itself when it gets to the bottom. So maybe it's not too surprising that if we're um, letting a package slide down a ramp, we'd want to set things up so that it's uh, accelerating at um, a lot less than free fall acceleration. Okay, so try to check if your answers make sense. If your answer is an acceleration, you can compare it to free fall acceleration to see whether your answer seems uh, to make sense. Our answer came out to be less than free fall acceleration, and that does make sense. Okay, so we checked that our answer makes sense, and now we've gone through this entire method. Um, now, of course, it took me a long time. You might think it took a long time for us to talk our way through this problem. Uh, I'm not saying that you should always do problems like this, this slowly and methodically. Um, hopefully, by the time you take your exam, you'll be doing problems um, a lot faster than this, or, or you might run out of time. Um, but when you're first learning the material, when you're first learning the material, it's good to go slowly and methodically to make sure that you're building um, good habits. And um, that's the way I intend to do the problems um, in, uh, in the videos that I'm making. In these videos, I'm going to do the problems more slowly than you would do them on the exams so that we can uh, be thorough and uh, cover the key ideas and uh, um, demonstrate a systematic approach. And then as you practice, hopefully um, you'll be able to eventually do the problems faster than that. Okay, now um, you might have noticed that the trigonometry portion of this problem was quite brief. The, the, the part where we needed trigonometry here was quite brief, um, but that's pretty typical. Remember that my point here was to show you how trigonometry appears in physics problems. And usually the point is, usually in a real physics problem, like you'll see on an exam, the trigonometry is just one small part of the solution. And there's many other parts to getting the problem um, right. And that gives us an important lesson um, you have to practice the Sokotoa trigonometry until it's boringly easy so that you can get the trigonometry portion of the problem right quickly and with confidence, because otherwise there's no way to finish all the other parts of the problem. So that's one thing that I wanted to demonstrate to you um, with this problem. By showing you that the trigonometry is just one small part of a larger problem, I hope you'll see that um, you, don't have much, you, um, you don't have much hope of um, getting these problems right in a reasonable amount of time and getting them right accurately um, when they involve trigonometry unless the trigonometry part is boringly easy for you. This is not supposed to be the hard or the challenging part of the problem. So the lesson here is keep practicing your trigonometry skills, keep practicing the Sokotoa skills we've gone over in this video series until you can get the Sokotoa part of the problem right quickly and efficiently. Um, get 100% right with that with no careless mistakes. Keep practicing this material until it's easy for you because usually the trigonometry is uh, intended to just be one small step in a much larger, much longer physics problem as we saw illustrated here. So one of the lessons that we were supposed to illustrate here is, as we've seen in the previous videos, if you know one side and one acute angle of a right triangle, you can figure out everything else about the right triangle using Sokotoa. Um, right triangles are very powerful tools in physics because you don't need to know much about a right triangle to figure out everything. 
So for example, here, all we knew was one angle and one side, but that was enough to figure out anything else we needed about this triangle. As it turned out, the only thing we needed was the hypotenuse, but we could also have obviously have figured out this angle and the adjacent side if we needed it as well. So this is a good idea to memorize. All you need to know is one side and one acute angle of a right triangle, and then you can figure out um, everything else about it. And now here's another important lesson from this problem. Don't assume that a number that's given in the problem is the correct number to plug into your equations, even if the number has the right units. So in this problem, we were given the number 0 0.9 meters, 0 0.9 meters, and that has the correct units for displacement. So it would have been very tempting, in our kinematics equation, it would have been very tempting to plug in 0 0.9 meters for delta x, because 0 0.9 meters is the number that we were given in the problem, and it has the right units for displacement. That's the trick or the trap that the professor laid in this problem. Um, the professor put in a number here to test whether students um, would unwisely try to plug this number directly into their equations. Okay, so we saw this was not the correct number to plug into our equation. We wanted um, the delta x is supposed to be the length of this side of the triangle, and the 0.9 represents this side of the triangle. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that we should ignore the 0.9. We didn't ignore it. What we did is we used the 0.9 to figure out the number that we needed, 1.8 meters, and then the 1.8 meters is what we actually plugged into the equation. All right, this is a pretty important lesson in um, physics. This is one of the most common um, popular traps on exams. I would encourage you to pause the video and think about this for a while and try to mentally prepare yourself not to fall into this trap. When you're taking exam problems, don't assume that the numbers that are given to you in the problem are the numbers that you will plug directly into your equations. Um, that's especially tempting if they have the right units, but even if they have the right units, they might still not be the right number to plug directly into the equation. Very often, you have to take the number that you're given and process it in some way to get the number that you need for the equation, as we had to do here when we took the 0.9 and used it to figure out the 1.8. Um, we, that's where we had to use SOHCAHTOA and trigonometry to solve the problem. Another important lesson of this problem is um, don't do SOHCAHTOA on autopilot. Don't use sine, cosine, and tangent on autopilot. We've talked about this previously. Um, in most problems, when you use sine or cosine, you end up multiplying by the sine or cosine. Usually when you're using sine or cosine, you end up multiplying by the sine or cosine. But you can't assume that's the case. Notice that in this problem, we ended up dividing by the sine. We took the number we were given, the 0.9, and we didn't multiply by the sine of 30. We divided by the sine of 30. Um, so don't do the problems on autopilot. Don't assume you're multiplying or dividing. Instead, simply follow the general principles. Identify adjacent, opposite, and hypotenuse. Use SOHCAHTOA to set up the right equation. And then use algebra. Use algebra to figure out what the calculation is you need to do. Here, the algebra told us we would be dividing. So again, I don't encourage you to try to predict ahead of time whether you're going to multiply or divide by the sine or cosine. Um, instead, just work through the algebra and let the algebra show you whether you're multiplying or dividing. Of course, that approach will only work if you're using these general principles to apply SOHCAHTOA rather than just kind of uh, doing the problems um, on autopilot and just assuming that each problem is going to follow the same pattern as the previous problem. Um, you can see that doesn't work. Many problems do follow similar patterns, but there are also some problems that don't follow the common pattern. Um, this is a problem that doesn't follow the most common patterns. So the safest thing is to work out what you need to do using SOHCAHTOA and the algebra. All right, well, I hope this problem gives you a, a bit of a feel for how trigonometry can be useful to you in your physics course. Obviously, this is just a taste of how you'll use trigonometry. There's many, uh, many other types of applications uh, where you'll use trigonometry in your physics um, class. This is just one small illustration. Um, but again, remember, one of the big lessons from this is that trigonometry is usually a small part of a larger problem, and therefore you need to practice the trigonometry skills we've gone over in this video series until the trigonometry is boringly easy for you. So now would be a good time to maybe go back to your textbook or some other source and try to find a bunch more um, trigonometry problems that practice the material we just went over and just practice that until these um, SOHCAHTOA type problems are boringly easy uh, for you. Um, if, you uh, if you can get to that point and build up that skill,
um, then that will give you a, a big advantage um, in the rest of your physics course. Um, I think that unfortunately, um, even though uh, um, sine, cosine, and tangent play such a big role in uh, the physics course, unfortunately many or maybe even most students never get to the point where they really feel 100% comfortable with what they're doing with sine, cosine, and tangent. Most students throughout the whole course, I think, many students are really just kind of trying to solve the problems based on um, common patterns without um, really understanding what the meaning of SOHCAHTOA is, what the meaning of um, opposite and adjacent is. Um, and as a result, many students, even at the end of their physics course, are not all that confident about sine, cosine, and, um, and tangent. Um, and that's a shame because that's, uh, that's one of the, the key skills that we're supposed to learn um, from the course. Um, so I hope that at this point you're feeling more confident about that material, and I hope that you'll do the extra practice that it will take um, to feel even more confident um, about uh, applying these ideas. Did you find this video to be helpful? If so, you can support the videos by making a monthly pledge of $1 or more at my Patreon page. You can visit my Patreon page by clicking the link on the screen or by using the link in the video description box. Thank you.